Well, Boris, is everything set? Do you have the uh, down in the vault all ready for us with the films? Hmm? <laughs> ah, welcome, my dear fiends. Welcome. Boris and myself here were just uh, getting a few of the extra ins and outs of the show, as it were, <laughs> before you arrived, and you snuck up on us, you sneaky little devils out there, always sneaking up on me and Boris, <laughs> trying to scare us, I believe, eh, Boris? Well, <laughs> you'll have to get out of the coffin s sooner than the uh, cock crows before you can do that, my dear fiends. <laughs> Oh, my evilness. Have you took a look outside lately? Let us take a little look outside of Gargoyle Manor here, the Monster Museum. Let's, let's go to that for a second. That weather, Ooh, snowy and cold, freezing bitterly, just falling upon us. So beautiful in its way that it brings out the dead things, you know, the the cold paleness of our gargoyles, the the twigs on our on our Halloween tree just dying to be seen throughout the rest of the winter. <laughs> it puts chills up and down my spines with happiness and well, cheerfulness in its own way. Right, Boris? <laughs> well, tonight, my dear fiends, in honor of the winter and the frozenness outside, I thought we'd pull from our vaults an old classic called The Frozen Dead, starring Dana Andrews. <laughs> ah, well, Dana, you remember Dana Andrews, eh? Curse of the Demon? How could you forget him and battling that demon at the end? Well, anyway, if you don't remember it, you can always go into our past episodes here at uh, Monster Movie Night and find it. It's the uh, Curse of the Demon. Anyway, it's it's been some years ago, eh, Boris? <laughs> Quite some years ago. Well, my dear fiends, let us not tarry. I know, I know it's chilly and you want to cuddle up to your fiend next to you. Well, do so. Get that blanket. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to chime in into the old keyboard here. The Frozen Dead, 1966, Dana Andrews. <laughs> now, let us tune in the uh the television here a little bit. There we go. We got the we've got the old internet haunted TV with its uh connections here. Now, my dear fiends, let us go into it. <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> I'll come and get you. Let me out. Let me out. <laughs> I've been watching you.
car. There you are. Come here. Are you sure General Lubeck said he would be here at 9 o'clock? Yes, Doctor. There's no more than 40 minutes from London Airport. He should have been here 10 minutes ago. Perhaps he forgot to adjust his watch when he left Berlin. Well, that's not likely. No one is more exacting than our ex-general. So, Carl, the temperature, please. Nineteen point five, Doctor. Miller is still frozen solid. Shall I level it off until the general arrives? When an organism starts to defrost, it cannot be refrozen without destroying the cells. You know that. But Miller has been frozen for over twenty years, ever since the war ended. Twenty ten, one year. The principle governing the decomposition of an organism still applies. You ought to know that by now. Twenty one point nine, rising rapidly. You better prepare the contacts. Contacts ready. And the leads. Leads are in order. And power. Power ready. No. But I'm not ready. I can't understand this sudden request of Lubeck to see us revive one of the frozen bodies. I'm afraid at best Miller will turn out like one of those seven failures. You call Joseph a failure? Well, it's certainly not a success. Ah. Oh. So it was you who reported to Berlin I was ready. Reported? Don't pretend surprise, Carl. I've known of your monthly reports to Berlin ever since Lubeck made you my assistant when the war ended. I was obeying orders. And all of us Germans know how to do that, don't we? Perhaps living here in London has changed your attitude toward the party. Oh, I'm as good a Nazi as I was 25 years ago. I'm sure you would never think of betraying the party. 95 degrees, Doctor. Then we can't wait. As soon as the body reaches normal temperature, place it on the table and attach the contacts. Yeah, well, hey, Doctor. Dr. Norberg has certainly found a suitable place for his experiments. Dr. Norberg's residence. Dr. Norberg is expecting General Lubeck and myself. Come in, gentlemen. How nice to see you, our doctor, after all these years. I'm happy to see you, General. Herr Dr. Norbert, Herr Tirpitz. How do you do? Well, this is Carl Lesson, my assistant. Herr Tirpitz, General Lubeck. Dr. Norberg, the band is too loose. 
Come. Well, that's fine. I believe we are ready. In a moment. Uh, start the power. Double it. Every two minutes, Carl, as we rehearsed it. Right, Doctor. It will take a little time, General, before we are ready. Oh, I can wait. I've waited 20 years for this moment. Oh, I can't tell you what it means to me and the party. I have a good idea. Oh, no, you don't. But I will tell you. It's time you knew. But, General... Hear me out, please. It's something you must know. Your achievement will mean the revival of over 1,500 of the elite of the Nazi party who had been frozen and hidden away all these years in caves, mostly in Germany, but also in France and even in Egypt. 1,500? Uh, did you think the 12 you've put into suspended animation by your instant freeze method were the only ones? Oh, no, how, Doctor. When the war ended, we Nazis of the elite level didn't have much of a choice. We could stay and face the war crimes cause, or flee like Adolf Eichmann. We could do away with ourselves. Or finally, take a chance with your method of preservation. To be restored to full capacity at the right time, which is now. Fifteen hundred lives. Did they do this voluntarily? Oh, yes, yes. Everything was explained to them. And that proves my faith in you, Herr Doctor. While we are waiting, uh, may I show Captain Tepitz the other three VIPs who are still to be revived? I certainly, General. Come this way, please. a day in 20 years. That's more than we can say. Those three and Miller are all that's left of the dozen that you so generously provided. As well as the money for your experiments, the expense for this English castle, your niece's education. Oh, I know exactly what you've been provided with and how much it has cost the party. But the stakes are tremendous and worth every penny of it. But do you know that one has not survived? And seven are mental cases. But what of your recent defrosting success? If you are speaking of Joseph. Judge for yourself. To revive a body is one thing. I've done that. But reviving a brain so that it functions normally, that's another and still unsolved problem. You mean that it was Joseph who was recently defrosted? Yes. Well, he was frozen accidentally. Joseph was trapped in the freezer for 12 hours. I discovered him and I revived him physically. But I failed to restore his mind. It functions on a subnormal level. And that is my great success to date. But Essen reported... Yes, Essen reported. But Essen is not a scientist nor a doctor. Essen's report is premature and incorrect. Are you saying that you have not restored anyone ever to normality? Precisely. But I will, with time. But there is no more time. We need our leaders now, immediately. Well, I warned you, General, 20 years ago, when you asked me to freeze the dozen, 
that it might take years to duplicate what I had done in restoring frozen frogs and snakes and fishes. The human is much more complex. It's a life! Well, that's a muscle spasm. The, the brain is the big problem. I will try to explain to you. Oh, Carl. Yes? Uh, keep an eye on the temperature and call me when Miller is ready. Yeah, well, Herr Doctor. Come with me, gentlemen. Come in, gentlemen. They are. Why do you keep them? They're useless. I'm still a scientist. Who knows? My next attempt may bring me closer to the answer. The answer to what? The brain has many functions, as you know. One is storing millions of facts, associations, and habits in a, I call it a memory bank, with millions of tiny deposit boxes. I have been seeking the critical microscopic spot in the brain which will set the whole memory bank in operation. I have only been successful in opening one deposit box which holds one particular memory. This was my first case. I touched the moment of memory in his childhood when he must have been deprived of something and cried bitterly for it. This man never tires of bouncing the ball. I, I can't, I, I, I can't do it. It's Shane. This is your brother, isn't it, Herr Doctor? Yes. Incredible how young he looks. I remember him when he was Himmler's own doctor. Oh, he's so proper and correct. And now he is quite violent. This one is harmless. He combs his hair continuously like a vain adolescent. He has seen or participated in a mass burial in a concentration camp. As you can see, he has religion. Look at him. Only 25 years old, and he X-90. He has seen old age and deposited that memory in one of his many deposit boxes. Uh, gentlemen, our patient may be ready now. He's breathing. Is everything ready? Yes. What is his temperature? 98.4. His pulse? 68. His blood pressure? 120 over 80. Good. Just relax, gentlemen. His mind now is a complete blank. Turn on the power, Carl. Hmm. 
just about ready. <laughs> ah, hello, dear fiends. Enjoying tonight's film, The Frozen Dead, about that Nazi mad scientist <laughs> who's bringing cadavers and pieces and bits and thereabouts to get, uh, to life again, kind of like Dr. Frankenstein in a sort. Uh, I thought I'd come back to the old laboratory here at Gargoyle Manor and give myself a little whirl uh, and and do my own little experimentation. I do love to experiment, get myself uh, in the mood for science and everything. <laughs> in fact, I have my own severed head right here in this sheer ball uh, crystal as it is you might can see yes isn't he something else indeed and once i get it experimented on and brought back to life i'll be able to do my own little things with the brain that's exposed here <laughs> all i need is a few chemicals in fact ah uh, here we go i i will need my brand new test tubes <laughs> as it were as you can see <laughs> Ah, yes, indeed. We'll just take uh, a little of this, and of course, we'll put a little of that over here, and that, and then, of course, a little, uh, a little bit of, mm, I'm not sure how well that's faring. Let me take a little taste. Hmm. Remember, boys and girls, never do this at home without uh, someone to uh, look over your shoulder, making sure that you get the right amount of poison. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Yes, yes, quite, quite the amount, quite the right amount. I'll get a syringe for that a little later and inject it into him. <laughs> and indeed, we'll be able to do all sorts of interesting things to this here cadaver. <laughs> Uh, he m might even need an electrical hand. <laughs> oh, Elsa, it's wonderful being home after two years. Wait until you see the look of surprise on Uncle's face when he sees me. He thinks I won't be finished with school until next week. I wish you told him about me. Don't be silly. Any friend of mine's perfectly welcome. You'll love him. Hello? Hello? Joseph, how are you? This is Elsa Tenney, a friend from America who's going to stay with us. Joseph, it's me, Jean. Will you bring in the baggage? Joseph. See who that is, Carl. You'd better go see what's going on upstairs, Carl. Yes, sir. Herr Essen will go with you, Joseph. Expecting anyone at this hour? No, not tonight. Where's your niece? Well, she's in America, taking her master's degree. She's still interested in your work? If you are speaking of my work with the party, she knows nothing of it. She doesn't even know I belong to it. 
All she knows is my interest and work in the repair of vital organs. I was just curious. May I proceed now? By all means. I will reach the membrane momentarily. Soon we'll know. Jean has arrived. <laughs> Fool, poor chicken, not that. Anything wrong? Uh, possible brain injury. Oxygen, Carl. What happened? Oh, my hand slipped. And... Yes? I may have torn the brain tissue. Fatally? General, nothing is more delicate or complex than the human brain. That's why I needed more time. You are a blundering fool, Essen. Miller was a young genius. It was a mistake, General. I did not mean it. There is no room for mistakes. Carl. You know that my niece had orders never to come down to my laboratory. She had not been home in over a year. She was so eager to see you, I felt she may have forgotten. Never. She knows nothing of my work. And just what does she know? Told you. Only what the medical profession knows. But I'm a surgeon who is able to freeze vital organs which are morbid, operate on them, and repair them. That is all. It's a wonderful cover you have established, Doctor. Thank you. What about Miller? I'm afraid Miller is gone. Just like that? Just like that. <laughs> Miller is better off that way since those we just saw. What can I do to help, Herr Doctor? Is there anything you require? Yes. The impossible. A live brain. One I can study and experiment with. Where would you get that? You need a head. I could get you one. No, Carl. Forget your friends at the morgue. A brain without oxygen for five minutes begins to decompose. It's not like an arm or a leg. Have you something in mind? Yes. I plan to keep an ape's head alive. I will remove the skull and replace it with one that is plastic and transparent. Then I can study the brain's functions in detail. Perhaps I will find my answers there. And I have invited the American doctor, Ted Roberts, to visit me here. He's arriving tomorrow. Roberts, isn't that the young scientist who recently duplicated the Russian feat of severing a dog's head from its body and keeping it alive? Yes. His knowledge and experience would save me a great deal of time. But don't worry, General. He will not learn anything of our real work here. Could we not use Miller's head? No, Carl. It's been damaged. You will just take care of him and dispose of that uniform as well. Yes, Doctor. Tonight, when everyone is asleep. Now, gentlemen, may I introduce you to my niece? Well, General, uh, would you have plenty of room here? Why not spend the night with us? I'm sure you will find it better than checking into a hotel in London. Splendid idea. And in the morning, you'll be able to meet Elsa. I'm sorry she isn't feeling well. Oh, all she needs is a good night's sleep. I gave her a sleeping pill. Oh, General? Well, thank you. I appreciate your hospitality. Uh, Carl? Yes, Doctor? Our uh, guests are spending the night with us. Oh, that is good. Of course.
quickly, Doctor. You must come with me. What, what is it, Carl? An emergency in your lab. An accident? Yes. Please hurry. We only have four minutes left. Four minutes? Four minutes for what? I will tell you later. Hurry. <laughs> What is he doing here, free? She is a friend of Jean's. I heard a noise and came down just as he finished strangling her. Doctor, there is your live head. You only have about two or three minutes left. Oh, this is impossible, Carl. This is murder. It has to be reported. Would you want the police snooping around? Time is slipping by here, Doctor. Soon her brain will deteriorate. I can't. What do you think General Lubeck would say if he knew you had this opportunity and rejected it? All right, so I go ahead. What am I going to tell Jean about the disappearance of her friend? Tell her that her friend did not like the place. That she left a note saying she would leave here by the six o'clock train in the morning. Well. Chain him up. And I will need your help, Carl. Hurry. Good morning. Morning, sir. I would like a ticket to London, please. Return ticket, sir? No, 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 only one way. This was a young lady. She does not seem to like our place. I'll get your ticket, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Miss Norberg. Isn't he upstairs? No. Joseph, where's Dr. Norberg? The laboratory? I must see him. No. No. He said he'd join us for breakfast. Now, won't you sit down, Miss Norberg? Uh, no, thank you. I do beg your pardon. What is it? things are gone. Oh, uh, yes, Jean. Uh, she left this morning. Just Carl to take her to the station. She left? Oh, she gave Carl a note for you. She says she's catching the six o'clock train and will call me from London. But why should she suddenly go to London? I don't understand it. Uh, why don't you wait for her to call? I'm sure she will explain it all to you. Oh, Carl. Yes. 
Yes, Miss Jean? Did my friend say why she was leaving? No, except she seemed most anxious to go. She bought a one-way ticket to London. <laughs> that is, I bought it for her at her request and put her and her two pieces of luggage on the train. Two pieces? Mm-hmm, two pieces. She is on to something. Yeah, nonsense, Carl. Naturally, she is upset, of course. Doctor, we must not let her find out about anything. Good morning. I'm Dr. Roberts. Ah, yes. Dr. Norberg expects you. I'm Carl Essen, his assistant. Come in, please. Thank you. I will take it. Oh, thank you. Dr. Norberg is in his laboratory. Why don't I show you to the guest room, where you can freshen up and relax? That'll be fine. Would you tell the doctor I've arrived? Of course. Can I help you? Who are you? I'm a guest of Dr. Norberg's. I hope I wasn't interrupting you. You weren't. Oh, please. If you haven't finished your, uh, whatever it is one does under a bed, I'll come back later. It's all yours. Still functioning. It's alive. What about the body? Buried. Very well. So I'm bringing Dr. Roberts down later to see the laboratory. Down here? What about? Keep the cabinet locked. If it weren't for your brilliant papers on the subject of keeping vital organs alive, I don't think I would have been able to take my first steps in that direction. There is no reason to be so modest, Dr. Roberts. Oh, uh, by the way, my niece asked you to excuse her. She will not be down for dinner tonight. Oh, I hope I didn't offend her. No, no, no. She is unduly upset by a girlfriend of hers who departed suddenly for London this morning. It's uh, nothing important. Would you, uh, would you like to see my laboratory before dinner? I would indeed. Doctor. Come over here. These organs have been alive for over a year. The heart receives nourishment through this tube, which carries oxygen, glucose, and whole blood. The waste matter comes out through here, this tube. The same process applies to the liver and the kidney. That's good. But these organs are small in comparison to what you have been working with, Doctor. To keep a head alive for a long period, that's what I call a real achievement. 
As I told you, it was simple once you pointed the way. I have something very interesting to show you. Come over here. Carl, please. But, Doctor. The curtain, Carl. Examine them, Doctor. Pulse is normal. Watch number four. It's amazing. You see, just as the brain sends impulses to its arms and fingers, I send electrical impulses to the same muscles in the arm. And they respond just as if the brain had dictated the movements to them. It's very interesting. You've not written anything about this, have you, Doctor? No, I prefer to keep it a secret for the present. I have another theory I would like to explore first. We will discuss the possibilities further at dinner. Top secret, eh? No, just an old habit. No one comes down here but Carl. I suppose I really do it to keep my niece out. I never discuss my work with her, or even in her presence. I understand. It's top secret with me, too. Do you think she'll join us for dinner? Possibly. Oh, gee. Uncle, look at this. What is it? It's a button. I found it upstairs under Elsa's... Oh. Oh, Dr. Roberts, this is my niece, Jean Norberg. Yes, I've had the pleasure of meeting Miss Norberg. Uncle, this is very important. Your pardon? Yes, the button. It's a button off Elsa's suit. She wouldn't just leave it anywhere. Gee. You are bent on making a big case out of her innocent departure, aren't you? Couldn't she have lost this button from her suit and not realized it? Or oh, possibly she was in a big hurry to get the early morning train to London and didn't want to make a big to-do about it. After all, there is her note and Carl's statement. What more do you want? Excuse me. May I see that button? Certainly. Did your friend have uh, three buttons like this on, on a floppy hat? Why, yes. I bumped into her as I was getting off the train. She seemed to be in an awful hurry to get on board. Was she carrying any baggage? I'm not sure. Well, Jean, I'm sorry.
What was it? A nightmare? I'll get you a sedative. Please stay with me. Was it that bad? Yes. I saw Elsa's body being buried. But her body didn't have a head. Then there was a flash of her head separated from her body in some kind of a dark cave. She seemed as if she was trying to speak to me. No sound came from her lips. I guess that one must have been when I screamed. I'm sorry. That's all right. Don't apologize. We all have our dreams. Sometimes they're quite beautiful. I'd appreciate that sedative. There's one there on the dresser. Would you like to show a visiting American a bit of your village and countryside? I won't be much company, I'm afraid. You still worried about your friend? Suppose that you felt that deep inside of you that something was wrong. That despite the contrary evidence, you were still possessed by this feeling. What would you do? I think I'd go and check it out. I'd go talk to the ticket collector to see if he remembered her leaving. But in order to do so, I'd uh, first accept an invitation to see the village. All right, then. We'll go to the village tomorrow morning. An excellent idea. Good night, Dr. Roberts. Why don't you call me Ted? Good night, Dr. Roberts. Good night. That's right. She was standing right there with her back towards me, waiting for the train. So you never once got a glimpse of her face? That's right, Mr. Orbib. I wish I could be more helpful. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Bailey. Even if you had a photograph of your friend, it wouldn't have been much use. Mr. Bailey didn't see her face. Look, Elsa's baggage! Stop him! Stop that man in grey! like some sort of a nut. You tell me to run and off I go. Even if those were your friends' valises, what was I supposed to do about it? Grab them and run off with them? They were hers. I'd know them any place. <sighs> of course, there are none like hers. You've never believed a word I've said. Why should you now? I've got to find out who that man is. Roger. Mr. Bailey? Yes, miss? The man in grey who just caught the train to London. Do you know who he is? Oh. I've only had a few passengers today. Oh, you mean Smith. R. Oh, Smith. Spelled S-M-I-T-H. <laughs> With his thick German accent, you'd think it would be Schmidt. Do you know where he lives? Oh, somewhere around here, that's to imagine. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Glad to be of help, Miss Norberg. Give my regards to your uncle. you for a moment, please. 
I was on my way out. It is very important. Who are you? My name's Jean Norberg. Come in. I'll only stay a moment. Do you have a husband? Husband? What I mean is, was it your husband or somebody that lives here that went to London by train about half an hour ago? What other reasons for your questions? He was carrying two pieces of baggage that belonged to my friend. I wanted to ask him when he'd seen her. My husband? He knows no other women. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to imply anything. Whatever you mean, my husband did not take any train today. That was yesterday. He is out now, walking. I'm sorry. That is all right. We all make mistakes. Thank you. destroy all of us. Oh, Carlos of Carl. You know it can't do anything to you. Why not? It is affecting them. More likely, it is the way you feel which is affecting them. They haven't seen the head yet. Are you trying to blame their condition on me? Not directly. Carl, is something upsetting you? No. Nothing. Someone has come inside door. My evil of a hey, Boris, you did go to the mail, didn't you? And look at here. What do we have? We have a package from our old fiend Flash Cooper and his lovely lady, Foxy Roxy. <laughs> Let's see what's inside, eh, hey, Mail Fiends? I love getting scare mail, don't you? Oh, let's see. Oh, let's just pour the contents out right, right here. Oh, yes, indeedy. Oh, yes, indeedy. <laughs> well, all right, yeah, well, okay. We don't need the, the, the packaging for right now. Oh, my evilness, look at that. Ah, very nice. It's even got a nice little chewed in. <laughs> Everybody loves these types of deals, you know especially from fellow horror hosts. And we have, oh, a wonderful picture to be put in a frame. Let's see, to Bobby, my horror host brother, your pal Slash, stay Foxy, <laughs> Foxy Roxy, aha. Wow, look at that, dear fiends, look at that. That will go into a frame. You can bet it will. And along and up on the wall with so many others that we have here. What else do we have? Hmm? Oh, well, we have a button as well to go on the shirt. It's a t-shirt. Let's see if I can get the button off without ripping anything okay i do love buttons and their cards oh they are very nice elegant okay well let's see what we got here ah, okay we will put it right here on my new coat how's that huh 
<laughs> indeed. And let's see what we have here. Look at there, my dear fiends. Feast your eyes, gloat your souls. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful t-shirt? Well, my dear fiends, thank you, Slash and Roxy. Thank you, thank you so ever much. And who knows, maybe in the short, near future, you may be receiving something of your very own as well. <laughs> Let us get back to the film. Hmm? This door, Ben! I'm glad I've seen you. I think I've found someone who can help you. The station porter saw that woman you talked to me about. Where is he? Come with me. Harvey! Yes, sir? Miss Norberg would like to talk to you a minute. Would you excuse me, Miss Norberg? I've left the place unattended. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Bailey. Uh, yes, miss. I saw the uh, woman you spoke to Mr. Bailey about. I saw them come by a car. I saw her get into the train. And a few minutes later, I saw them going by in the same car. And a woman in it with him. I thought it strange at the time. Are you sure it was the same woman? Yes, the same as I'm speaking to you. She must have changed her mind about going by train and got off. What did she look like? She had that big floppy hat on, covered all her face. I'm very grateful. Thank you, miss. You could have killed him. I had to stop him. Not by murder. It could have been an accident. Carl, it is just not like it was in the old days when the party had to do such things mm. for political reasons. Mm. What are you going to tell him? Something of the truth. Make it plausible. Mm. You are going to be all right, Doctor. Oh, oh my head. A slight brain concussion. Uh, what happened? A most unfortunate accident. Uh, it felt like an avalanche. Uh, did you bring me here? No. I did. What happened? Dr. Norberg will tell you. Dr. Roberts, my brother is, uh, he's mentally ill. He is sometimes violent. He has been this way ever since his experiences in a concentration camp. I brought him here with me 20 years ago, hoping to cure him. Jean's father? Yes, but she knows nothing about him. She thinks he is dead. My brother broke loose and he attacked you. It was lucky that I heard him. Yes. Yes, I understand. Uh, Miss Norberg, let me have the address of Mrs. R. Schmidt. Or rather, Smith. 16 Horace Street, Inspector. 16 Horace Street. Yeah. Miss Norberg, you needn't fret about whether the story you've just told me is credible or not. It's my job to check everything out. Thank you. And uh, by the way, Miss Norberg, keep an eye on Carl Essen and don't let anyone know of your visit here. It might be dangerous for him. It's incredible how you've been able to hide Jean's father here all these years. Well, the walls are soundproofed, and Carl is a great help. I really can't understand why he was so lax as to leave the door open. Sometimes my brother is very belligerent. Perhaps Carl has been working too hard these days. He's very tense, I can tell you. Yes. The whole house is, if you ask me. You mean Jean, too? Especially Jean. She's certain that her friend did not leave, voluntarily. I'm afraid she may be right. What do you mean? Doctor, what I tell you must be between us as scientists. Do I have your word? Yes, you do. You know how you were attacked. Well, Elsa, Jean's friend, was killed by my brother. But 
It wouldn't do anyone any good to tell Jean or the police. And I didn't want her to be burdened with the knowledge that her father was not only mad, but a murderer. But a murder must be reported. Yes, Doctor. That is true. But her unfortunate death seemed to be the perfect solution to the problem of my experiment. To obtain a human brain to study. There are doctors who experiment with their own lives to gain medical knowledge and advanced science. Why could I not close my eyes to the law just this once and use a dead person to help? Her life was gone already. You used her head? You kept it alive? See for yourself. If it were not for your papers, I never could have done this. It's absolutely fantastic. I hoped you would be impressed. Your nutrition goes through here. Your oxygen through here. Wonderful. Can she see? Hear? Talk? Think? React? As a doctor, you know that I do not have these answers yet. Perhaps we can find them together. At the moment, the oxygen and glucose are at a minimum, and she is in a state of unconsciousness. But if I increase them, she will open her eyes, and her facial expressions will change. So I know that she responds to a certain degree. What I hope to do is to find the right nerves in the brain. I touch the wires which motivate the arms to her, and then tell her to move them. No, I will turn on the nutrition. What's this? It's a great achievement, Dr. Norbert. First, a blank expression, and then that hatred. She certainly is alive. And you will assist me? Yes. With your promise that no one will hear of us, especially Jean. You have my word. I want to apologize for being so rude to you. That's not what kept me awake. Yes, Jean, I do understand. Do you? You don't think I'm imagining things? Well, what makes you ask that? Because suddenly you seem to be taking me seriously. Well, I can't see you enduring these dreams night after night. Suppose something had happened to her. Like what? I don't know. It's just a supposition. But if something had happened, you'd have to reconcile yourself to it and start living your own life. Is this something you're trying to tell me? No, no. No, not at all. Look, it's late. Have you got a sleeping pill? Your 
frightened off. What's the matter with you? What happened? An inspector was here, asking a lot of questions. He's looking for information. Did he ask about me? <laughs> if he's interested in you, he'd be too smart to ask. Besides, we've never been together, except for the train business. But what can he find out? You and William are here legally. There are records to prove that. There are also earlier records to prove who I really am. They are gone, destroyed. That's what you keep saying. Besides, they would never recognize you. Not after what those liberated Schwein did to me. We are safe, I tell you. Get rid of her. Your uncle's a brilliant man. You seem very interested in his work this morning. I'm sorry, Jean. You know what we scientists are? A new concept and we're carried away. In case it gets lost, I will put it in Dr. Norbert's file. I'll probably be busy with your uncle tonight. But how about dinner tomorrow night? Do you think you could concentrate on me? Well, yeah. Jean, you, you remember Inspector Witt? Of course I remember him. He just called up to ask if he could stop by for a chat. An old boyfriend, eh? Uncle, may I see your lab? Mm. Oh, my lab? <laughs> I'm surprised that you asked this. You have never shown an interest in it before. Oh, I'm sort of curious, I guess. Because, of course, you can see it if you want to. No reason why you cannot. As soon as Dr. Roberts and I have completed an experiment we are working on... Thank you. Will you excuse us? coming down until we are ready, and when she does, we will hide everything. Dr. Norberg, why don't you tell her about her father? If she knows he is alive and we are trying to help him, she will stop looking around. Well, she has only a normal girl's curiosity, that is all. And why is that inspector coming here? It's nothing important, I'm sure. Suppose he starts to get curious. <laughs> why should he, after all these years, Carl, what's gotten into you? worried about Jean. What does she know? More than we think, I tell you. Nonsense, Carl. If I tell her about her father, I will have to explain why he looks so young. When I have mentioned the concentration camp, she has always understood I meant we were prisoners, not Nazi administrators. You should have told her the truth when she was a child. And have her live with guilt? No. Why should she? She is innocent. Oh, this is Dr. Roberts. Let him in, please. That head. I'm glad it cannot speak. Oh, come in, Dr. Roberts. 
Are you ready? Ready, Doctor. Okay. Oh, march out, please, Carl. She's conscious. Yes. There is nothing we can do about that now, Dr. Roberts. I don't think I can go on. Her eyes. Yes, I understand. Oh, uh, Carl, a towel, please. Perhaps Mr. Essen can give us a lead. For well, he has the afternoon off. Uh, he's been with you ever since you arrived from Germany, hasn't he? Yes. Any family? None that I know of, no. Would you ask him if he'd call in and see me tomorrow? I'll be glad to, Inspector. Well, thank you very much for your time and cooperation, Dr. Norva. Always glad to be of assistance, Inspector. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, do you know the, um, the Smith people in the village? Are they Germans? No, I, I don't believe I ever heard of them. Do you think Carl Essen knows them? Well, I'd be glad to ask him, Inspector. No, don't bother. I'll be chatting with him myself tomorrow. I enjoyed the tea. Goodbye, Inspector. <laughs> Where do you talk now? I've told you again and again. No one knows of our project. I swear it. And you never heard of the Smith? I do not know of any Smiths. Perhaps a little more persuasion will make you remember. Yeah, bits. <laughs> right. You would think the war was still on. It is. I just told you what I suspected the inspector had on his mind, not that I had any base for it. We cannot take any chances, Herr Doctor. You did the right thing. Yeah. So, after my graduation, I went into research. Jean. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I that dull? No. It's just that my mind seems to be constantly drawn to the laboratory. You'll see it soon. We nearly finished our experiment. <laughs> Tell the general what you told me. <gasps> well? I know the Smiths, my family. They know nothing. I am loyal party man. Why didn't we know of your relationship to them? I meant to tell you when they came, but I was afraid. You have neglected your duty. Yes, General. They helped me to get things for the doctor. Did not want to tell him where they came from, but I got them anyway. What things? Ah. Uh, a heart, other things. I thought they came from the morgue. No. You needed them. Morgue would not cooperate. So got them anyway. You mean you... From the next town. Two women. <laughs> Man. You and your family committed murder? No. You needed them. I am loyal party member. And your family knows nothing of the purpose of those, those objects? I swear. Go to your room, Essen. Think he's telling us the truth? 
Go see the Smith. Harry. Jean. Yes? Do you remember your father? Or your mother? No. I guess that's why good friends mean so much to me. You mean Elsa? Yes. Just Elsa? No one else? Upstairs, he tried to kill Dr. Roberts and Jean Norberg. Where is she? They're both all right, just frightened. I'd better go to her. Wait, you heard she's all right? They think it was an accident. They do not know he pushed the flower pot off the window ledge. Oh, she may need me, please, General. Wait, her Doctor. <laughs> she knows too much. <laughs> what do you mean? He's hysterical. He probably doesn't even realize what he is saying or doing. Kill her. I say kill her. I'd better give him a sedative. What good would a sedative do? What then? In there. Tepids. Tepids. the temperature. Dr. Norberg! We can proceed with your test, Sir Doctor. Tepitz, call Dr. Roberts down. We cannot waste time, Herr Doctor. Herr Doctor, I said we cannot waste time. Your niece is all right. Yes. How is Jean? Frightened, but she'll be fine. Doctor, you ought to check those flower pots. They're dangerous. Yes, I will. Herr Doctor, you were waiting for Dr. Roberts. Oh, yes. Where's Carl Lesson? He had to leave suddenly. That's strange. He was so anxious to be here for the test. Something urgent, he said. Shall we proceed? Yes, are you ready, Doctor? Ready. You have no willpower of your own. You will obey my commands. At the count of three, you will raise your arms. One, two, three. Did you check the connections carefully, Doctor? Yes, when we finished this afternoon. I'd like to see the chart myself, check the connections. Oh, don't you have it? 
Hall. Well, then I guess Essen has got it. Where does he file things? He doesn't. Nothing leaves this laboratory unless I take it. But I thought he said... I remember seeing Carl looking at it. Can't you call him? No. I'm afraid I can't. How, Doctor? Is it impossible that she just refuses to obey? She has no willpower, for all. I've never been convinced of that, Dr. Norbert. I tell you, she hasn't. I must point out, Doctor, with due respect to your work, that neither of us has seen any evidence of will or lack of willpower. I tell you, I know. I know! Yes, Doctor, yes. Don't humor me! No, Doctor. Pull yourself together. No, you... Wait, excuse me. Now, Doctor. Now, Doctor, control yourself. Go to your niece. Yes. I'd better go to my niece. As brilliant a scientist that he is, Norvax is also a fool, just like Essen. I wonder why Essen did that chart. Yes. And why did he want to kill the girl and Dr. Roberts? He said she knew too much. Perhaps he was not as hysterical as Dr. Norberg suggested. You think she knows? Yes. If she suspects, or knows anything of our project, or what happened to her friend here. Everything would go. Twenty years' work. Must look like an accident.
Let me go, Chad. I've got to get in there. I'll let you in. But first I must talk to you. I can't wait. Elsa needs me. Is she in there? Yes. I must go in. I don't have the key. But if I don't prepare you for what you're likely to see, I can't be responsible for the consequences. I want to help you, Jean. Is she all right? I'll explain everything. But not here. Try this, it'll relax you. Thank you. <coughs> Water, please. Oh, there's none here. I'll go and get some for you. <coughs> is it that bad? Yes, it is. And Jean. Please don't ask any questions until you've heard it all. Do you remember my joking with you about that dream when your friend was buried without her head? Well, that's just what happened. She's alive. Please, Jean, I want to continue. The reason is quite obvious. Depression over her friend's sudden departure. Yes. But will Dr. Norberg and Dr. Roberts believe it? Norberg will convince himself that it is true. As for Roberts, that's up to him. Besides, if he calls in the police, how will he explain his part in that business of the severed head? It was your father who did it. He didn't know what he was doing. I don't know how to explain it. I just went along with your uncle's suggestion. She was dead. It couldn't hurt her. Where is my father? I believe he's in a room beyond the laboratory. He's been there all those years. I don't believe it. Why didn't my uncle tell me? Perhaps to spare your feelings. I want to see my father. I must. He wouldn't know you, I'm sure. Besides, he's dangerous. Don't come near me. I'm trying to help you. Jean, I made a mistake. 
I know that. But I didn't create this whole situation. Don't blame me for it. Poor Elsa. She wanted to leave. You're not to blame. No! What is it? I don't know. It was as though someone tore the glass out of my hand. This isn't water. We better get out of here quickly. I'm not going. Somebody put something in that bottle for you. Why? Perhaps to keep you from discovering Elsa? Oh, no. No. It wasn't me. I love you, Jean. We're going to the police right away. I'm not leaving here with you. But, Jean. If you mean what you say, find Inspector Witt and bring him here. I can call him. No, bring him here. All right. Keep the doors locked when I leave here. And open them for nobody until I return. Is that agreed? I'll open them for no one. Please. Be careful. What are you doing here? What have you done? Where 
is my father. Dr. Roberts told you? I want to see my father. Did he? Did Dr. Roberts tell you everything about him? Yes, yes. But my poor brother is mad. That it was he who killed your friend. Oh. It wasn't my father. Who was it? Your oh. Essen saw it himself. It was Essen who did it. Jeep. Behind this wall. Show it to her, her doctor. Let her see it all. She knows nothing of that. She knows too much. Why not all? <laughs> There's your friend Essen. Has your uncle told you that he can unfreeze them? Has he told you that your father was one of them too, until he was unfrozen by him? My father wasn't a Nazi. Ask your uncle. You're lying. No, Jane. It's true. You're mad. All of you. One of the ingredients of success, no? In our mad world. And now, no, no. Can't do that. I must! Slip aside.
What a chilling ending, eh, Boris? <laughs> Mad scientists, they never learn. You know, you've got to be careful who you, whose head you cut off and put into a, 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 a receptacle and whose arms you put up on a wall and the dead bodies being frozen like that, especially if they're Nazis. Oh, dearie, dearie me. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, we do hope hope you enjoyed tonight's little terror tale to get you through the cold and the winter. <laughs> Until next time, my dear fiends, as always, keep screaming. <laughs>